Good morning to everyone who has just joined us. We are continuing the roundtables at Emerging Valley 2021. We're going to be talking about venture capital investment, looking for financing for startups. 2021 is uh, 2021 the year for African unicorns to emerge? How and why can African tech become the new epicenter of international VC? We have a very renowned panel uh, panelist uh, panel with us here today. We have Isabelle Bebeard, head of international European affairs at BPI France. Mrs. Marem Dieng, who is the lead of global innovation strategy at 500 Global. Marem Jiang. We also have Abiba Adi, who is a project manager at Meet Africa 2. Round of applause, please. Could you please put your hands together for Bamba Lo, who is the founder of PAPS. We're very lucky to have with us one of a, the, a representative of one of the largest Japanese investment funds, it's Satoshi Shinata, who is a general partner at Keppel Africa Ventures. Japan from Tokyo. Vous pouvez applaudir Satoshi qui uh, s'est connecté avec nous depuis Tokyo. Et nous avons avec nous également Monsieur. And we also have Mr. Gregory Clement, who was unable to come to Marseille. Fortunately, he is able to join us online. Is Mr. Clement here with us? I think we're just going to connect to Mr. Clement very shortly. In any case, we have a fantastic panel for this round table. So we're going to be talking about 2021. It has revealed all of the potential of African tech with the arrival of four new African unicorns one of them is from French-speaking Africa. We're going to talk about opportunities and the arrival of these new star, uh, gem companies. They will be changing the paradigm. One of the most successful startups in francophone in the francophone world, and a real actor for the economy in Africa. I would like to talk about perspectives. I would like to understand where we are going in this investment context. Where are we going to be having more unicorns? What kind of unicorns do we have? And what what uh, role does the investor have in the African ecosystem? I would like to welcome all of my participants. First of all, we're going to start with Mariam Djega. Would you like to speak in English or French? in French, please. Oh, okay, perfect. You are the Global Innovation and Strategy Lead at 500 Global, an investment fund that is particularly active around the world and focuses on technology companies, especially in Africa. Can you describe your African portfolio and the type of companies you choose to support? How have you seen 2021 compared to previous years? There's been a, a genuine revolution of investment in African startups. I would just like to start by thanking you for inviting us here to Emerging Valley 2021. Our fund is based in San Francisco and we focus a lot on investing in Africa the ecosystem is showing us once again that VC investment not only has its place in emerging ecosystems but also for startups and 2021 has really proved this to us. We have realized that VC investment that has, uh, has quadrupled in Africa this year compared to last year. So we can see that there's a real appetite for investors in Africa, not only once again because there are fantastic investment opportunities, but also because it is in 
uh, the interest of everyone for um, investment to be done in Africa for startup companies. So today, 500 Global is based in San Francisco, where an investment fund we help. Uh, we focus mainly on s companies in the seed phase, so Series A and Series B. In seven years, we have helped over 2,500 startups all around the world. We have over 20, uh, sorry, 41 unicorns in our portfolio. What we want to do is uplift economies through entrepreneurship, and the way that we do that is that we focus on investment. Let me explain why. Because we want to give development opportunities for economies. And above all, it is important to do that in industries that are linked to challenges and problems in local uh, settings. The work that we are doing today supports not only startups, but we also support economies when we are looking to do so in the most amount of emerging economies as possible. We have invested in over 78 companies in Africa. A lot of them have been, of course, in Africa, in uh, Egypt, Nigeria, but as well as countries such as Ghana, Senegal and Kenya and Tanzania that are these days areas where entrepreneurship and especially technological entrepreneurship has become a primary resource of uh, a primary way of addressing local challenges. So that is what we do. Thank you so much, Marem. We're going to be coming back to you very quickly. Thank you so much. Uh, a round of applause, please, for Mrs. Jiang. It's a, a fantastic opportunity for us to have a representative from Silicon Valley here. I think that uh, you'll be very popular after at the round table. Many people in the room will want to come and talk to you. We have the chance to have uh, one of the biggest Japanese investors today. He was supposed to be here with us in Marseille, but due to the situation, he had to go back right, to, right away to, to Japan uh, because otherwise he would not be able to go back to Japan. So thanks. Satoshi to be with us. And uh, my question is, Keeper Africa, you're based in Lagos. Uh, the fund is based uh, uh, as a, um, uh, um, an antenna in Lagos and recently set up on the African continent and built up a very impressive portfolio in record time. And uh, what is Keeper's investment strategy? And what are your favorite regions and sectors? Thank you very much. Um, very nice to meet you all. Unfortunately, I'm attending from Japan because of the travel restrictions, but I'm very proud to be here. So uh, we are Capital Africa Ventures, based in Nairobi, Lagos, and Tokyo. And I'm the one in charge of West and North Africa. And we have invested in more than 90 startups across 11 markets in the continent in the past three years. And to your question about our investment strategy, first of all, we want to a deep funding gap in the seed stage, seed stage space in Africa. So we decided to invest very quickly and efficiently with small check size. And for us, um, it is also important to make follow investment because our vision is to become like a vertically integrated VC platform so that we can support the startups from the seed stage to growth phase and toward exit. So the role we have to play was to quickly invest in seed stage startups, then to move up to Series A and Series B. And to do so, um, even within this year, in the past, uh, oh, okay, it's, it's almost a year, yeah. In this year, we, we've already connected our portfolio companies with seven Japanese companies to direct interest into our portfolio companies. And by doing so, we want to bring the strategic investors into the ecosystem who can provide the support for the growth phase and also even provide exit through acquisition by these Japanese companies. So, this has been our basic investment strategy. And out of the seven companies we brought the Japanese to invest this year, actually 
it, of seven are based in francophone African markets. So we, I cannot tell the names because it's, it hasn't been announced. But we have also been quite active in francophone West African markets. And also, um, because we have more than 90 portfolio companies, we try to facilitate more collaboration and synergies among the portfolio companies because we have our mission to create new industries from Africa. So we can't, we don't take its investment as like standalone investment. Rather, we would like to create a cluster of the business models so that we can nurture the industry coming out of Africa. So yeah, that's our basic investment strategy. And also to your question about our favorite focus in terms of the sector, um, actually we are the sector agnostic. Uh, we have four pillars for investment. The first pillar is to in a platform slash infrastructure on which other, other startups or other businesses can also build their business upon it. So, and the second pillar is to help B2B businesses. Because if you look at the current African ecosystem, to see market still like immature and consumer spending power is not as high as other markets. And also supply chain has lots of inefficiency. So we have to improve efficiency of the supply side first. So the retail price for the consumers can get low and make it more affordable for the consumers. And also in Africa, usually the consumer, so the small business owners, need to enable them as business owners fast. And as they in revenue, they have more purchasing power to purchasing power as consumers. And our third pillar is to invest in leapfrogging super innovation coming out of Africa which can expand to outside Africa. And the fourth pillar is to help startups make African content by Africans for Africa. And um, we are very keen to invest in any business models related to lifestyles emerging out of penetration, internet, and mobile phones. So we focus on these four pillars. Thank, thank so, yeah, you. that's pretty much about. Thank you. Africa. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, uh, Satoshi. On peut applaudir Satoshi depuis Tokyo. Thank you so much, Satoshi. A round of applause for Mr. Shinada from Tokyo. I have a question for Mr. Lowe at PAPS. I saw that at the beginning, your institution was just an idea, and now it is one of the m most amazing tech success stories in Western Africa. You work on transport within cities, transporting merchandise. Tell us about, just quickly, could you please tell us about your solution and tell us why this type of model is attractive for investors in Africa? You have raised funds recently. Please tell us about that too. Thank you so much, Samir. Hello everyone, good morning. My name is Bamba Lo. I am the CEO and co-founder of PAPS, which is a logistics platform. We create an infrastructure that helps other people do business more easily in our countries. We have warehouses, relay points that help um, wholesale sales of pharmaceutical products, for example. Sometimes we even have vaccines that are transported on buses. So we have a very informal infrastructure. What we want to do is to try and formalize it. That is our challenge. First of all, we started by creating an application, but then we realized that that is not just as simple as that. We needed to create the infrastructure around it. So we came up with uh, the idea of creating an institution generating investment opportunities and proposing a 
complete logistics solution for our customers. The relationship with uh, relationship uh, the relationship with investors came along a little bit later in the story. After about two years, and uh, the investors that we started uh, working with in 2018. Uh, saw myself and my colleague as people who uh, would never let up, who would always work hard, and this is how our company has now evolved greatly. We are now on a different level. We are being funded on different levels with different interest rates. Seed or pre-seed investors that um, take an interest in us see us as very serious people that we're focused and motivated by what we do, perhaps they might, we might end up with 1% or 2% of the market and build a very big company. We need the technology, the relevant technology, in order to be able to implement our projects. So PAPS has now existed for five years. We have over a million delivery points in Africa for example, banks or telecommunications. Perhaps uh, really plays the part of uh, a, a relay point in our country. Now I'm going to hand over to Habiba and Isabel. I have a question that I can't not ask. We can see that things are happening in Senegal. We saw the success story of WAVE. We're going to be talking to Mr. Papadou Amasa during the closing sequence. Have you seen this wave of investors and successful companies in Africa yourself in the Ivory Coast, for example? Do you think that this the same will happen in Senegal in terms of investment? Yes, I do. I think that if we take into account the fact that Senegal is just simply a brick in the wall of uh, African investment. We have been working on building the ecosystem and infrastructure for many years. Many structures uh, still exist today. I'm thinking about Wali, for example, and Jumia, which is a very important company in Senegal and creates the required startups, uh, the required talents for entrepreneurship in the local e ecosystem. So all of the work that Omar has done has gone through the Wiza and now, for example, uh, for Wave, the newest unicorn in Africa. At some point or another, perhaps has been a part of their story. And now we are thinking about how to evolve. The more that we evolve, people are saying that in 2021, Senegal's economy will grow by 10%. So there is a real opportunity in Senegal. There is a, a real opportunity for growth and investors are seeing this. We have uh, Mariam, 500 Global is a Senegalese company. So there must be something there. There are actually very few French speaking or at least French investors in Senegal. I know only one of them and he's here with us today. He, it was quite underground. They set up in Abidjan in Kenya and they started investing in startups. Then normally we have, it's really more about investors in Paris that look at spreadsheets all day long. We've been working with Satoshi and our relationship, uh, it only took two weeks for us to start collaborating effectively together. So yes, I think that there will be more unicorns and more uh, opportunities, for example, in America, in, J in Japan. We don't worry about getting in uh, foreign investment. I'm wondering, uh, if uh, institutions will start investing in Africa, perhaps um, we can uh, start talking with them as well at some point. I think that Bamba has raised a very important question. Senegal works has been working on entrepreneurship for 15 years. So now we have a new generation of investors who are interested in Senegalese startups. 
But what is even more important is that these entrepreneurs such as Omar, De Bersen, De Citic, are really people who are uplifting Senegalese ecosystems and have been doing so over the last 15 years. This is a fundamental point of the local entrepreneurship on the local ecosystem. I would also like to see the situation in, I would also like to see this in other French speaking countries. It's not just about investing, it's about enhancing entrepreneurship. Small and medium business are business as an extremely uh, essential part of the economy. Of course, startups are an integral part of the top grades, but there are very, very many small and medium enterprises. That is what has contributed to developing the corporate landscape, the B2B landscape, and this has helped enhance uh, the ecosystem. Entrepreneurship has always been a way, a historic way of developing economies. When I hear people saying that we're, they're going to bring entrepreneurship into Africa, I say, no, you're wrong. Entrepreneurship in Africa has existed for a lot longer than that. We've, been, we've seen this ourselves on the continent. And what we're seeing in Senegal today is the fruit of all that labor. I don't want to be too biased, of course, but of, Senegal has st still many lessons to learn. But I think that this is important for all of the different country, uh, countries that do not necessarily have a, uh, a big economy. They need to focus on their competitive advantage and once again enhance and foster their small and medium enterprises. This is a really important, important way to tackle certain challenges and a way to, to see. Well, for example, in Africa, we have uh, certain problems. We need to develop the entire infrastructure in Africa. Thank you so much. Uh, please, a round of applause for Bamba. Uh, you've talked about Narcisse uh, supporting uh, SMEs. Uh, Omar will be with us tonight uh, for a presentation, but thank you very much. I'm sure you will uh, get quite a few questions. You talked about the delays in uh, European investments, but there are also some European investors who support the ecosystem, who support businesses and create funds that are a major pil pillar for the startup ecosystem. Uh, this includes BPI France, uh, who have been a historic partner of Emerging Valley in the past few years. Isabelle Bebéard, the Director of International Affairs, uh, is here with us and uh, last year she announced the launch of a major program supporting funds and startups, uh, the Averroes uh, Fund of Funds. Uh, you've launched it a few months ago now, so how is it going? Uh, and more specifically, we saw that the BPI developed in the Ivory Coast recently with uh, the Inspire for Africa event. How is uh, BPI France acting uh, today in favor of African entrepreneurship? Isabelle, can you uh, tell us how the Averroes Fund has been doing so that we can uh, get an insight into a major funder? Good morning. Uh, thank you, Samir, for having me. I'm very happy to be a partner of Emerging Valley. This is a very important event in, in the year for, for startups and for relations between Europe and Africa. BPI France is engaged in Africa and has been for years. We started our first investment in 2002. So it's been a while and in 2004 uh, we decided along with Proparco to create a common vehicle called Averroes Finance investing in uh, North African investment funds and then things moved forward. We've developed a few vehicles uh, and now uh, we are working on the fourth called Averroes Africa. We've expanded our remit to the whole of Africa, North, South, East and West, French speaking, English speaking, Portuguese speaking without any distinctions. And through this Averroes Africa Fund, we invest in African uh, development capital funds and African venture funds. 
We've created this fund this year, as you said, and we are, have already invested in three projects. We are supporting two uh, development capital teams, and the other one does venture capital, series A and B. Afrique Invest in association with 40, and we are investing in Partech Africa. Venture capital is a segment we are very interested in in Africa. We are doing a lot of that, including in France. And I think the growth of startups in Africa is uh, bound to play a, a major part also as a source of jobs and wealth and development. So this is one of the activities that we have in Africa. Another activity is our work as a, a consultant. So we advise governments or institutions that want to create similar tools that work like BPI France. Uh, of course, adapted to their local context. We partner with Tunisia for smart capital. Tunisia has recently created um, an institution that funds innovation. So they've crea created their own fund of funds called ANAVA uh, for uh, venture capital and startup capital in Tunisia. They've also created uh, reimbursable grants for startups in Tunisia. They have a fund supporting innovative uh, SMEs. So we are partners in this project. We do a lot of work with Senegal. Uh, we've been uh, talking to Adair for many years. So what Papsaf is doing in Senegal is absolutely brilliant. Uh, recently, I've, uh, I've witnessed the signing of an agreement between the AFD and the Senegalese Minister of Finance to support their projects. So uh, France is definitely present there. I'm always amazed. We've done a bit of French bashing, and it's quite natural because we're in France, but I wish... Uh, more Africans would invest in Africa because it's all well and good to wait for the French or the Europeans to invest in Africa. But uh, I think African investors should also invest on the continent. And so far, I think there are not enough African institutions or African uh, individuals investing in Africa. When I see associations like ADER or like French Capital, when I see African governments that are committed to support startups, Funding startups is quite risky and it's not always attractive, uh, at, the, at least in the very early phases. So it has to be Africans themselves doing it. And I'm very happy to see that a number of governments are uh, becoming aware of this and are getting involved, including Senegal. Yes, thank you, Isabel. Please give her a round of applause. Now, let's move over to Habiba. I saw that Grégory Clément, the Managing Director of Proparco, is here online. I'll come back to you later. We're very happy to have uh, Gregory with us today. But first, let's hear from Habiba. You are the Project Manager of the Meet Africa program, which supports entrepreneurship in the diasporas. I think Senegal is involved as well as the Ivory Coast and Tunisia and Algeria. Can you please introduce the program? It's got a budget of 8.5 million euros over three years with funding from the European Union, from the AFT, and it supports African entrepreneurship through the diaspora. Can you tell us a bit more about the program and the profile of the beneficiaries that receive funding from Meet Africa? Thank you, Samir. Good morning to all of you. Meet Africa is a program that started in 2016, uh, led by Expertise France. And uh, it's during its pilot phase, it supported 80 project leaders, uh, all entrepreneurs from the diaspora based in France and Germany, who uh, who 
want to uh, start businesses in their countries of origin or in other countries in Africa. And then following this pilot phase, we uh, noticed three facts. The first thing was the need to improve information and support from entrepreneurs. Secondly, to streamline the support process and to involve uh, stakeholders from the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And third thing is to bring startup funding because often there are funds that uh, kick in later on, but it's too risky to support the creation of new businesses. So this is how Meet Africa 2 was born with a budget of 8.2 million euros funded by uh, the European Union and the AFT. It started uh, just over a year ago and it's more ambitious. We have three objectives. One, to co-incubate 100 entrepreneurs from the diaspora from six countries, Tunisia, Morocco, Senegal, Mali, the Ivory Coast and Cameroon. And we are thinking about what we can offer to other African countries who are not partners at the moment. So, and uh, it's uh, the the African diaspora living in Europe. So it can be any European country, France, Italy, Belgium, wherever. Uh, we. Uh, our second objective is to provide seed funding for 170 businesses from the diaspora with a fund of 2 million euros uh, in grants to uh, back these businesses' uh, existing funds. And the third aspect is networking. We want to create an entrepreneur network that's uh, pro-African, people working together in their respective countries so develop an entrepreneurial ecosystem that can sit around the table, find out who does what, uh, understand how we can create a value chain of support services, because often these projects are just starting up and there are missing, there are gaps in their curriculum. And it's also about learning from other countries that might be more advanced, like Senegal and Tunisia, to share good practices uh, for all our member countries. We also uh, build capacities in uh, the ecosystem. We uh, work with two types of partners. We have institutional partners and technical partners. The idea is to to uh, create a momentum that's lasting and that can help us implement uh, long-term programs where institutional partners commit to support uh, business creations in our uh, member countries. So we work with the APME in Cameroon, ADPME in Senegal, AFIPA in Tunisia and so on. And then we have technical operators, incubators, accelerators, financial partners and so on. And we support businesses with their fundraising as well. We currently have 76 laureates who are receiving support from six incubators based in France. And then uh, in Africa, they will work with other incubators in their respective countries. Almost half of our entrepreneurs are female. They're between 24 and 60 years old, working in sectors that include mostly uh, the digital sector, education, the food industry, as well as uh, crafts and trade. Out of our 76, about a third have already uh, owned a business and uh, already have a turnover and uh, employees. We both target uh, entrepreneurs in their early stages and entrepreneurs who've created uh, their business under three years ago. Thank you, Abiba. We are happy to receive the manag managing director of ProParco, Grégory Clément. Hello, Samir. Yes, I can hear you. Mr. Clément, you are the managing director of ProParco, which is one of the main public investment funds that's uh, dedicated to the public and private sector. You're a branch of the ADD that's dedicated to the private sector. Uh, at the heart of your mandate is uh, supporting SMEs 
as uh, DF5 uh, involved on the continent. Can you tell us about the many programs uh, that Proparco runs to support startups, uh, in particular the Choose Africa program? How are you supporting African entrepreneurs today? Thank you, Samir. Thank you for having me. And uh, sorry, I wasn't able to be in Marseille. I would have loved to be here today. So I will uh, tell you about the main programs we've been implementing for the past three or four years since 2018, or 2018, actually, if, uh, since the announcement uh, of Choose Africa by President Macron. Choose Africa is 2.5 billion euros uh, dedicated to funding and investment into SMEs as well as startups exclusively on the African continent. So 2.5 billion euros. This was uh, President Macron's uh, uh, announcement and we implemented this. During the pandemic, we added another billion euro, which shows it Choose Africa Resilience. That's a different program that was mostly dedicated to uh, the businesses that were the hardest hit by the crisis. Of course, entire sectors have been struggling, including transport, uh, hospitality, tourism, and so on. So this additional effort showed the solidarity of France uh, with the continent through uh, programs of guarantee for the most part. Uh, both programs, Choose Africa and Choose Africa Resilience, uh, do very much focus on startups, including seed funding. From the, uh, from since 2018, we created a program called Digital Africa that gave rise to the creation of an association of the same name. And our commitment was 65 million euros to be deployed across the continent. To this day, we've deployed more than 70 million euros. So we've uh, reached the target we'd assigned ourselves. And as you might have heard during the new uh, France-Africa summit, we uh, made new commitments. So there will be additional funding. We decided that the figure will be grown to 130 million uh, over the 2022 uh, to 25 period. So we are doubling up the amount uh, for the coming period. And to do this, we're going to be we're developing our synergies with uh, Digital Africa. Thank you, Gregory. We'll come back to you at the end of this uh, roundtable. Uh, I would like to hear about future perspectives for VC in Africa. We talked about unicorns and about new investors joining in. Um, now, I would like to hear from Marem. As an investor, you saw a, a number of businesses that were initially uh, working with P uh, SMEs uh, that became unicorns, companies like Partec that's supported uh, by the BPI. According to you, what is the perspective for 2022? Are we going to witness the emergence of a new standard with more and more African unicorns with uh, French and African investments uh, s helping these champions emerge? How do you see the next trends uh, from the Silicon Valley? From, uh, in terms of investment, what we are observing as investors based on the other side of the Atlantic is that Africa is a priority for us. A few years ago, we could have said that these were uh, isolated cases. Today, we are seeing that this is becoming a mature ecosystem with examples like Wave, Opay, Cheaper Cash, and uh, businesses today that have received support from this ecosystem 
that were created by mature entrepreneurs that received support from African VCs or international VCs uh, with investors such as Satoshi. So we are observing that these, the ecosystem is maturing. The second thing is that more than ever, investment in Africa is no longer a matter of charity, but it's a matter of business. It's a business decision. If today you look at the portfolios of businesses across the continent, you realize that investing in these businesses is seen as an asset by these investors. If you look at how uh, the due diligence is carried out and at how co-investment is made, you realize that this is first and foremost a business interest. This shows that, again, we are dealing with a mature ecosystem. Uh, the uh, startup and VC ecosystems on the continent are very young. It's only just beginning to blossom. And when you look at other locations, you realize that it takes time to create an ecosystem. And Africa needed time. It probably still does need time, but it is reaching a certain level of maturity. What we are observing today is that we would like to develop our investments on the continent. We would like to be present on the ground because uh, we've done a lot of helicopter investment so far, meaning that we've invested from San Francisco and our other uh, regional funds. And what we would like to do now is to be able to invest on the ground because we want to be uh, there. We want to be within reach of the entrepreneurs. Investing is not just about investing. You have to be there for your businesses to help them grow, to help them raise other investments and have new rounds of funding. So our future on the continent is to be able to be on the ground. Another thing is that today we can see the number of single investors on the continent has been multiplied by five. Beyond the fact that there are lots of institutional investors on the continent, uh, both African and international states, and these are necessary to reduce the level of risk uh, uh, during the earlier stages, we can also observe that uh, VC is growing and investors are growing. Not just in Africa, it's VC is growing around the world, including in Latin America, in uh, APAC countries, Malaysia, Thailand, India. Today, VC investment is growing. Startup technologies are growing. And uh, in Africa, we are seeing success stories. So we are uh, getting to a point where the ecosystem is uh, more mature. And this growth can be, uh, should be contextualized within emerging markets. Africa is an exceptional case because that's, and, and we like it because that's where we come from, but you have to look at the rest of the world. Uh, you must look at what's going on in Eastern Asia, in Latin America. Uh, there is this global growth towards technology and startups in general. And for us as a VC, it's important to be part of this worldwide glo uh, growth. Hence uh, your name, uh, Strategy Global. Thank you, Marem, for this 360-degree uh, vision. Satoshi, are you still with us? Yes. Okay, Satoshi, uh, in less than two years, uh, you have invested in nearly 100 startups in Africa, which is very impressive. Uh, in your opinion, it is better to bet on uh, several CMEs, startups, or just one uh, unicorn, or, um, according to you? And what criteria show that a startup is really booming and has the potential to close mega deals, according to, to you, and to Keeper Ventures. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I think we really need to make our African ecosystem sustainable. And in order to do so, uh, we always need new startups, keeping birth and growing to become Series A, Series B startups, becoming a unicorn. So we cannot stop this cycle. And, and I think as an investor, I'm most excited by, you know, seed stage startups and how, you know, we have to look at how these 
new seed stage startups are coming up. Usually, like we are seeing more and more entrepreneurs spinning down the successful unicorn startups. For example, in Nigeria, we have seen lots of Jumia mafias or interstate mafias who are spinning out from these successful startups. I'm sure, like in the next three years in Senegal, maybe we, we see Bamba Mafia or Pep Mafia. Pep, and we are really excited to see, you know, this cycle continuing in, in, in Africa. And of course, um, to, 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 to have this growth from the different side of the, we also need investors investing in seed stage startups. So um, we can't just, you know, focus on unicorns, but we have to the ecosystem more sustainable. And adding on to that, I think uh, this year we have some M and A's um, among the startups in Africa. Like in Morocco, Shari um, acquired another startup. Also, like Sandy from Kenya invested in Ivory Coast similar startups. And also, like um, we have seen several examples like. Um, MFS investing in Nigerian fintech company. So I think this kind of consolidation among the startups is also a great validation of the ecosystem in Africa getting more mature. And maybe in addition to that, um, I think the bottleneck of the startup ecosystem in Africa used to be the seed stage. We used to see the biggest funding gap seed stage but this year, we have seen more increased capital flowing into seed stage and also very later stage with the participation of Tiger Global or Sequoia Bank. So I think that Series A and Series B are becoming more like a bottleneck and sweet spot. So, you know, we always have to think about the whole life cycle of the ecosystem. And we have to be nimble to support the biggest bottleneck of the ecosystem. And also that's why we are now moving on to the fund to focus on Series A and Series B. So yeah, that's my take. Thank you. Thank you, Satoshi. Merci beaucoup, Satoshi. Thank you very much, Satoshi. Thank you for being with, her, uh, being with us here from uh, Tokyo. We very much hope to be able to see you in person next year you are more than welcome thank you so much now isabel i'd like to ask you a question it's a little bit technical but that is the role of the bpi to support this ecosystem should in so in 2022 should we expect a COVID effect on the number of deals for instance, in funds of funds, have you seen certain delays in the own fundraising that happens? Or, on the contrary, has this pandemic been a kind of catalyst for investors and, to, and brought about new investment projects? <clears throat> I think that in 2020, we were all so surprised that we had to organize ourselves and adapt so quickly. And so, yes, there was a certain delay, not just to do with getting around, but also because we had to focus on investments that had already been made. And when we uh, you know, manage funds of funds or when we're managing companies that we've just invested in, we, need to, we needed to be there. We needed to be there to help them, I think, in 2021 the level of vest investment in african companies has been over 80 million uh, sorry 80 billion dollars yes indeed as we were saying with partech so sorry 4 billion dollars it is enormous you can see the world is still trying to work out all of these investments and all of these sectors that have benefited from the crisis. That is another point in Africa. Sectors such as e-health, e-education, 
digitalizing companies. These are sectors that have actually benefited from this crisis. <coughs> so actually, I'm very optimistic about 2022. And for example, as we have seen with WAVE this year, it is very easy to think that this trend will continue in the coming years and it's something that we're going to need to get used to. I would just like to say, because earlier on you were mentioning the fact that in Africa that there is another initiative that I wanted to speak about, we have also had to adapt to this situation. We have a, a digital platform called Euroquity.com which was created in 2008 to finance startups. It had individual investors with tax exemptions, exemptions in France. This is developed enormously. So now we have 20,000 people who have signed up to the platform. Over half of them are from overseas. This is developed in France, Europe and Africa. There are innovative companies, about 2,000 inventors and incubators and accelerators. So this crisis, during which it was difficult for us to meet each other in person. So what has actually happened is that we have now a VC uh, community and every three months these VC investment investors present opportunities from our portfolio to other VC investors. These are VCs that come from Europe, Africa, America and Japan. And this initiative was really implemented because of this crisis. So yes, in a sense, it w this crisis was a catalyst. Bamba, I'd like to talk about future perspectives. As a founder and an entrepreneur, you have to come up with your company's growth and financing strategy. What investors are you looking for? And apart from being valued at $1 billion, what objectives do you have to scale up your company at PAPS? Thank you, Samir. So at the moment, we are not fantasizing about the idea of becoming a unicorn. I think that that is a little bit later down the line. It took way of 10 years to have a model that could be emulated elsewhere. And then after that, it became a unicorn. For the moment, we cannot predict anything. It's difficult for FinTech in Africa to become a unicorn. I want my customers in Cameroon, Senegal or Ivory Coast to feel supported, to feel safe. And so to do so, we need an eco an ecosystem that is structured. This ecosystem must enable us to facilitate exchanges and discussions on the continent. They also need to have stakeholders and the right customers. So there is also always this relationship in Africa and other continents in Asia, Europe or America. So for me, there is no e-commerce or VC that is African. There is just e-commerce. So how can we, uh, if we look at Amazon, uh, we need to think, well, how can we become Amazon tomorrow? How can we look at the eco ecosystems and what are the links between Europe and Africa? Doing so helps us enable our customers consume. As I was saying, I think that all of this is possible because we are currently at a phase in our ecosystem whereby we have companies that have not yet exited. I think that so we don't have an exit. Our ecosystem is still too immature. Exiting this ecosystem will be later down the line and this will take time. This is why at the moment we are building and developing good companies and then we need to have investors that believe in our vision of investing in these companies. 
we need entrepreneurs that have expertise. A founder such as me, f every five years you need to reinvent yourself to become the new leader of your own company. Look, there are many things that we don't learn and that is why we need to have investors around us that have specific industry related um, knowledge and know-how. An, an investor that says uh, e-commerce, logistics and of course in your portfolio you will find customers Of course, you will find investors as well. At the early stage, it might be a lot B2B, which brings you in customers. I think this is uh, really dependent on the phase that the company is in. In Series A, there is a second filter. It might be f fewer investors that invest in Series A. Series A. Investors might think, okay, I'll invest in education, but not in South Africa, more so in Kenya. And then you might end up not actually properly understanding anything. This is why we can say that today there are still not enough investors in seri Series A. There are enough accelerators, but we need more Series A investors. Everything, uh, all of the companies that perhaps invested in uh, over the last year will continue developing and expanding. This maturity requires a certain amount of time to develop, and I'm not sure what else I can say. So, yes, indeed, that's uh, really summed things up perfectly. We have two minutes left. A round of applause for Mr. Lowe and Mrs. Bebear, they pre presented their vision to us. Abiba, we need to talk about the diaspora. It is one of the main sources of indirect financing. I think on the continent, of course, we all know um, the amount of money that is sent back to families. How can we capitalize on this incredible lever to increase support for African entrepreneurs and, in and address the shortcomings in this Series A? How can we have intelligent mechanisms thanks to the diaspora? I think that diaspora has a twofold, if not threefold, skill set. They want to help, even emotionally speaking. They want to support Africa. And they also have knowledge and know-how from Europe. When someone from the diaspora creates a company, they're actually creating two companies, one here and one back home. There is a real level of expertise and know-how about financing mechanisms. There is capital that is put together upstream. When companies are set up by diaspora, they actually have the same level of development as uh, a company or an SME back home. So this is why today the idea is all about capitalizing on this double culture about transferring money back to Africa and the relationship between Africa and Africa if I may say so. We need to be wondering what can the diaspora do these days? What can we do to support it to ensure that more, there are more African investors We must have more European African investors that are cross-cutting and cross-border. We need to have incubators and wonder about how investment can be a lever to lead to other financing schemes. How can public institutions and governments help the situation? 
I feel that the diaspora really has a message to give to institutions and public uh, entities across Africa to say there is a potential, this is what we want to do, this is what we're willing to do, we have the right knowledge, we want to bring our teams, we have the money. There might be tax exemptions. support for travel, help for visa applications. As we have seen today, getting partners from overseas can be very tricky. It's going to be very tricky. This is what the diaspora has to offer. So transferring knowledge, funding, which are savings, but can be transformed into investments. And we very much hope to have more investments in Series A on the long term. Thank you very much, Abiba. So, Gregory Clement, you have 40 seconds for the conclusion of this roundtable. It's over to you to pitch. In just one minute, okay, a lot of things have been said. What I wanted to say is that Africa is a very entrepreneurship focused place these days. There are institutions that want to support entrepreneurs and there are many tools that are available to help them. You need to be present during the seed phases as we are today and we know that this is where uh, this is the riskiest phase of any company. We need to work, focus on building and co-constructing ecosystems and to do so we need to foster seed funding and investment. We need to be a driving role and integrate stakeholders and listen to the knowledge that they have to contribute. The message from stakeholders is very clear. And I think that this was mentioned earlier on. It is very important to put heads of companies and entrepreneurs in contact with one another to accelerate the development of startup companies and ensure that they have the right connections to expand their companies. This is a very important aspect. For me, there is one other thing, and I'm afraid I'm going over the one minute time limit you gave me. is that specific and specialized investment funds need to be uh, present and available to help the initial phases of uh, startup companies in Africa. Expertise France these days, this is what we are trying to do at the moment. Thank you very much, Gregory Clement. Could we have a round of applause? And for all of our panelists, we had a very high level plenary session. Thank you all so much for being here. I would like you to put your hands together for Mariam Jing, who's told us about her experience in Silicon Valley. Bamba Lo, Isabel Bebea, the head of international European affairs at BPI France. Abiba Adi, the project manager at Meet Africa 2. We're going to take a quick photograph and then move on to the next debate.